So as we began our series on heaven last week, we kind of took a, the drone view, we said, over everything, kind of looking down at uh, several things the Bible says in general about what we call heaven. One of the things I want to go back and revisit, and I'll take a moment probably to do this each week that we talk about this, is that it's important for us to fully understand what the Bible teaches about heaven we must fully understand where this concept of heaven falls into God's plan of redemptive history. We understand that God created a perfect world. After creating the Garden of Eden, and everything that went with it, the universe, all that Adam and Eve could see with their eyes, God looked at it all and said it was very good. It didn't remain very good for long because Adam and Eve sinned and spoiled God's perfect creation, including hindering the image of God that, with which they had been created. And even today, we live with such a tainted image of God's, uh, tainted uh, depiction of God's image within us. But God also promised that he would send a Redeemer. And he did through his son, Jesus who, first of all, has reversed the curse of sin, that all who would believe in him and trust in him, that their sin would be forgiven and that they would be made new creations in Christ. That what sin had destroyed and what in fallenness, the fallenness with which we were born, that the, the blood of Christ would overcome that and our sin would be forgiven and we would be brought into the kingdom of God and we would be brought in as his children. And he would begin this process of remaking us and restoring us. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things pass away and new things come. We live today somewhere in this process between our fallenness, redemption, and restoration. All of us live in that today. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you have experienced redemption, and you are now experiencing through His work in your life His restoration, where through His Holy Spirit He's conforming you to the image of His Son. But this restoration is going to come to its fruition in completeness one day when God sets everything back right. Now the reason we need to rehearse this constantly and understand this is because if we're not careful, we get the idea that the afterlife is all about us. That God created heaven for us. And that God uh, is going to take us all to heaven for us. Dramatic pause. Because that's not entirely the case. God has redeemed and is restoring this fallen world, the Bible tells us, to the praise of His glory. Jesus is the hero of the story, not me. Heaven will be where this glorious work of God proving His glory by creating something per perfect, letting it fail, and then recreating it into something. It, it's all meant for the grand purpose of of displaying the splendor of the glory of God. Now, now God loves you. Don't, don't make, I don't want you to hear me minimalizing you and me and our, our home in heaven, but I want you to understand that, that heaven is, even though it is a place for us, its primary purpose is not so that we can feel good or be good or be happy one day. It is the place where God's glory will forever throughout all of eternity shine. Because that's what we'll be doing. We'll be sitting there thinking, man, isn't it great living here? No, we'll be sitting there thinking, isn't it great? This Jesus that redeemed us and allowed us to have this life. It's going to be about Him. Now, I say all that to say because today and next week, I may challenge some things that you have heard for much of your life because I find that what has happened is that in our American experience, in the 20th and 21st century of our American experience, we make a lot of stuff about us. 
And so we have mixed and mingled a lot of the Bible's teaching about heaven now and heaven in eternity, and we've kind of wadded it up into one big ball, and we call it the same thing. And you say, well, preacher, what's the harm in that? Why is it important that we, we know the difference in paradise and the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth? Why is it, isn't it just enough to know that we're going to be in heaven forever? No, because that's about us. We rob God of his glory and by not seeing the progression even in what happens to us when we die. Without seeing the progression, we fail to see the full glory of God in display. We see, fail to see the act of God glorifying himself. So I want to encourage you to fasten your seatbelt. We're going to look at what scripture says. We're going to kind of untangle the web a little bit. Now, most of what you probably have heard is true. It's just a matter of putting truth in the right place. And understanding truth, that truth, in the right context. So uh, you're not going to come out of here thinking, man, I promise you, nobody will leave after this series going, I don't know if I want to go to heaven after all or not. If that's the case, I think we're going to long for heaven even more when we see in truth what the Bible teaches about it. We're going to kind of de-earthize heaven a little bit and make it what God intended it to be. But today I want us to talk about what the Bible refers to, what, when Miss Barbara read the scripture for us, very popular scripture of the thieves on either side of Jesus, Jesus telling the one thief, today you will be with me in paradise. What happens to a believer today when they die? Every one of us sitting here today has someone we know that has passed from this life into eternity. And so we can take great comfort in knowing what God has said about those who are His and what happens to them when they die. Now, in theological circles, we call this the, this time between now and... And what we read about at the end of the book of Revelation with this new heaven, this new earth, theologically, this is the fancy word they use for this. This is called the intermediate state. I never really liked that. sounds so clinical. It sounds like in school, you know, when you don't quite... I mean, you're not one of the worst kids, but you're not one of the smartest either, so they put you in the intermediate group. It kind of reminds me of one of my favorite Yogi Berra stories. I can't remember who the lady was, but he was a lady who was one of the um, one, one of the leading ladies in Great Britain. She was in the she wasn't royalty, but she was like you know a duchess or something like that. And she was pleased to meet Yogi Berra, and she shook his hand and she said, "You're such a warm person." He said, "Thank you. You're not so hot yourself." If we're not careful, when we hear the intermediate state, we well, that's not so hot. Well, in a sense, it's not, because <laughs> there is a place in the intermediate state that's very hot. But the place where the believers go is still not quite the glory that we're going to receive when God makes a new heaven and a new earth. So I want us to understand that, to see where believers go when they die. And the main point we get from this is that when a believer in Jesus dies, he or she immediately enters the presence of God. Now hold on to that one truth because no matter what you have heard or haven't heard, that is one truth that, that, that is undeniable based on Scripture. That the moment, the moment a believer in Jesus leaves this earth, they immediately are ushered into the presence of God. And one thing I want us to know about, about this intermediate state, this place where the presence of God is, is that it is a literal place. I mean, when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, that's talking about a, a place. Uh, there is a false teaching out there that says when a person dies, uh, their soul goes to sleep. They call it soul sleep. And it just exists in a state of unconsciousness until the final resurrection when the soul is awakened and the body is made new and they, they, then, no. 
Jesus said, today you will not sleep with me in paradise. Today our souls aren't going to lie down in the grave and take a long nap. No, today you will be with me in, in, in a place that had a name. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now Paul kind of had a quandary. We read about Paul's quandary in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21. Beginning verse 21, he said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But he goes on to say, If I live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet what I'll choose, I, I can't tell you. And he said, I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. So he, he had a quandary. There was a place in the presence of Christ that he knew that once he left this earthly existence that he would immediately be in the presence of Christ. And that was attractive to him. And I, I, I can tell you, I'm with Paul on that. That is an attractive proposition. I don't want to sound morbid like I've got a death wish or anything like that, but I understand what Paul was saying. I love you and I love being with you, but man, being with Jesus is going to be so much better. And he said, I, 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 I'm, I'm ready to go. If I stay, that's great. God's going to use me, but if I go, I get to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, the New Testament uses two words, two different terms, to describe this place. One is paradise, which we heard him speak uh, to the thief on the cross, but another place where you'll find it is also called Abraham's bosom. And Jesus told a story uh, about a rich man and a poor man, and when the poor man died, he went to a place called Abraham's bosom. We can understand that being the presence of God, being paradise. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But I want us to consider in the time that we have left this morning, so if a believer, immediately when they die, they go to this place that's not necessarily forever heaven. It's this presence of God, and you can call it heaven because it, it is that, because it is where God is, this place. What is this place like? What is life in paradise like? What's happening right now? in paradise. Now also understand that in the realm of the dead, and we'll, we'll see this in just a moment in the parable that Jesus tells, there are two places. There is this Abraham's bosom, this paradise that is a place in the presence of God. And then there is this place of torment. One day that place of torment is going to be thrown into a place of even greater torment. And one day that place of comfort and reward is going to receive an eternal place to live with a glorified body that will be even greater than we could have ever imagined. So as we understand that, I want to invite you to look in your Bibles at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, again the words of Paul where he's talking about these two places. Look what he says beginning in verse 1. For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly bodies, is destroyed... We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, we talked about this word heaven last week, how it can be described. Um, now, where is this place called paradise in the heavens? We don't know. Uh, it doesn't show up on our GPS. You know, we don't, and God has not told us where this place is. We know that it is a specific place. It is not a material place. It is not a place that is made of brick and mortar. Uh, it's a place that is made, as he said here, a building from God not made with hands. It is an immaterial place. We understand even now that there is, a, uh, there is an unseen spiritual realm that coexists with this physical universe in which we live. All right, now that, that may be, that might have been like a, whoa, wait, what? Is the preacher talking about he's seeing things now? Is he hallucinating? No, I said it's unseen. We looked at a couple of passages last week where God allowed Isaiah to see into the throne room of heaven. 
He had to be allowed to see it. He couldn't see it naturally. We looked at where John uh, was told, come up here and I'll show you what must take place. And he again was ushered into the throne room of heaven. There was this place that otherwise they would not have allowed to be seen. Paul talked about a man who was taken up into the third heaven. There was a realm that was invisible. A universe that was unseen with human eyes. But one of my favorite stories of this takes place in 2 Kings chapter 6 where the Syrian king is trying to undo and wage war and defeat the, the, uh, the Israelis, the Israel, the northern kingdom. And God speaks through Elisha, the prophet Elisha, quite often telling the king of Israel, okay, don't make your camp there, don't make your camp there. He basically, God was using Elisha to let the king of Israel know where the king of Israel was going. He was exposing his military secrets. When the king of Syria understood that, he was upset. He thought one of his own was a traitor. He said, tell us, who among us is ratting us out and spying and going and telling the king of Israel what's going on? And they said, it's not us, but there's a prophet named Elisha, and he's telling the king of Israel everything. The king of Syria says, well, fine, where is this Elisha? They said, he lives in a place called Dothan, not Alabama, in Israel. Lives in Dothan. So the king of Syria sends a, most of his army. He goes, fine. We'll put an end to his little trick. Completely surrounds the city of Dothan. So all these Syrian chariots, horses, and soldiers have completely besieged the city. Elisha's servant says, boss, we got a problem. We're surrounded. There's nowhere to go. Elisha said, no, you don't understand. Those who are for us are more than those who are against us. Go look again. And in the meantime, Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes to see. Second time when he went and looked, he saw chariots of fire, great in number, standing at the ready to protect them. And in a miraculous way, Elisha said, okay, God, strike them with blindness, cause them to be confused. And he did, and the Syrians basically just fumbled all over each other and destroyed each other without Israel being in trouble. That servant was allowed to see inside this realm that normally was unseen. So I believe this paradise is where our invisible souls because they are the immaterial part of us that we cannot see. They, they reside in this realm that is normally unseen to those of us outside of those realm, that realm, those of us that are still trapped inside of a human body. And that's what Paul was saying, um, that, we, that we are longing, though, to put on our heavenly dwelling. This is, we're longing for that time when we'll be in our final state. But here we are in this intermediate state. We die, we immediately go into the presence of Jesus in that state. Our souls exist without our bodies. That's why he's saying we're in a house not made with hands. Look what he says further down. Verse 6, so we are always of good courage. Knowing what's out there, knowing where we go when we die now, knowing what our future is, we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Now, by the way, let me just kind of correct one of the misstatements we make. We say sometimes that Paul said, well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He didn't exactly say that in those words. But that quote came about from this passage of Scripture. Paul makes this statement that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So it's quite logical to say the opposite then. That when we are absent out of this body, we are at home with him, and we're at home with him, we're outside of this body. So we exist outside of our physical body. We go to a funeral, we have a graveside service, we put a body in a casket, we lower that casket in the ground, and we say at funerals, he's not here. She's not here, and we're right about that. That's just a shell. That is, as Paul referred to, this, this earthly tent that we live in. Because the soul, the invisible us, has gone on to the presence of Jesus. 
And we'll receive our perfect bodies at the resurrect, final resurrection. We're longing to put on our heavenly bodies. Verse 8, we are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we're going to make it our aim to please Him. So we see that even Paul recognized there was this place. It wasn't quite our permanent place. But there was this place while we are awaiting. And here's what happens. See, why, why then is it, why don't we go ahead and get all of that now? Why, why, why is there this intermediate? Because you understand the plan of God. We are still in this age of redemption and restoration. God is still in the process of saving souls. There are still lost people who will hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, who will be saved. And so once everybody who is going to be saved is saved, then it'll be time for him to come back and open up graves and so that all the bodies could be resurrected and be reunited with souls. But until then, he's not leaving us just floating around out there in limbo. There is this glorious place in his presence where we go. We call it paradise or Abraham's bosom. Now let me ask you to look, if you would, at Luke chapter 16. In Luke chapter 16, as I said, Jesus tells this story of a rich man and a poor man. The poor man he calls Lazarus. Now, is this the Lazarus that uh, was the one he raised from the dead? We don't know. I tend to look at this as Jesus was just saying, let me tell you a story. And he just, he just used names, Okay. Lazarus was a common name. It may have, he, may have had this, he may have had that Lazarus in mind when he was telling this, but I don't think that Lazarus had died yet. And I don't know that this was when that Lazarus had been brought back from the dead, when he did die. So I think he's just kind of telling a story. He says in verse 19 of Luke 16, There was a rich man clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. So you get the picture. This guy had it made. He was living the life. He was living his best life now. And by the way, if that's all you want is your best life now, then that's all you're going to get, your best life now. But if you recognize there's a better life yet to come, and that life is yours through Jesus and what he's done for you, then that life will be yours to come. And they said at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. In other words, he was basically settling for crumbs, for what they threw in the garbage. He was a dumpster diver. That's the context you can put this in. He hung out by the dumpster and ate what they threw away. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Picturing this picture of abject poverty. So the poor man died... And notice what happened. He was carried by angels to Abraham's side or Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, that is the compartment in this intermediate state for those who weren't believers, who were being tormented, who were being punished for their disobedience and their failure to believe. In Hades, in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So just let me stop there and just kind of point out some things, and we'll, we'll go a little bit further in just a moment. First of all, notice through this, what is paradise like? Well, the moment as believers in Jesus that we die, we are ushered by angels into the presence of Jesus. Now let that truth sink in for a moment. How many of us sat by the bedside of one who was transitioning from this life to the next. And we watched them exhale that last breath of earth's air. And we could know that at that very moment, they didn't have to find their way to heaven on their own. They didn't have to fly solo. God sent ministering angels carry them into the presence of Jesus. I get goosebumps thinking about it. He cares enough about us that he sends 
the entourage to pick us up, take us home. What a beautiful, beautiful picture that is of where we are today. So we're ushered into paradise. Notice that also in paradise there is, shall we say, cognitive awareness. I mean, there's not soul sleep. There's conversation happening. There are even people in this invisible realm. One side of the invisible realm can see the other side. of the. They're in this invisible uh, existence now. They see each other. And conversation is taking place. And they're recognized. The rich man recognizes Lazarus as that that dumpster diver that hung out behind his house. I know that guy. I've seen that guy. I passed by that guy. He was recognizable, and he, and he saw him, and he, he knew him. We see also that conversation takes place. That the rich man in, is talking to Abraham, and Abraham is talking to that rich man, and Rich man's asking for things, by the way, that can't be done. He said in verse 24, he, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. You had your best life now. Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here. And you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. So, we understand we're ushered by angels. We're in a place where there's cognitive awareness. Abraham tells Lazarus, remember. Think about this. Think about what life was like on earth. So I believe there is an awareness. We'll remember what life was like on earth. We're not all of a sudden in this world where we're just in this new dimension and we, the, the, the life we once lived is foreign to us. No. He, remember. Remember this. In fact, that is part, to me, that's part of the rich man's torment to remember all those times he passed by Lazarus. It wouldn't help Lazarus. It wouldn't do anything for him. and just laughed everything off, thought he had everything made. All the pride that filled his heart, everything about it, that was even part of his torment. Not just the flame that was causing him excruciating pain and causing him to be parched. But on the other hand, Abraham said, Now Lazarus is comforted. I don't know a lot about what we'll think about in paradise. I don't know what, a lot of what those souls who are in the presence of Jesus are thinking about now, but they're aware of their last life. And I, and I will say that their time here on earth, even if it was bad or if it was rough, I won't say they'll forget it, but whatever happened to them, they're comforted now. It is a place of comfort. It is a place of peace. It is a place where whatever was tormenting them on earth no longer torments them in this place in the presence of God place of comfort, but then finally I want us to see it's a place where our destinies are eternally set. There's a teaching in the Catholic Church of a place called purgatory. Uh, I liken purgatory kind of to a cosmic penalty box. If you watch hockey, you know that if you're not a, a good boy or girl, you get sent to the penalty box. And so the Catholics have this belief that if you were if you weren't in good standing with the church, but you kind of believed in God, and you could go to this little holding place until somebody else prayed enough for you or did enough for you that they would buy your way out of the penalty box and get you into heaven. That's not true. Jesus told this rich man, you are where you are, and you can't get to where we are. And where we are, we can't get to where you are. In other words, your eternal destiny is set. Now what we'll see as we look forward into heaven in the future next week is that paradise 
at the end when all the bodies are resurrected and we receive glorified bodies, then these dismembered, uh, disembodied souls that we have will be reunited with those bodies and we'll enjoy this eternal existence with God forever. But those who were in Hades, those who were in torment, will be reunited with their bodies also. And they will be thrown into a lake of fire and they will forever be tormented in the flame. So as we kind of tie a bow around paradise, I want to kind of just go back and highlight a few things we looked at. And then I want to leave us three suggestions for prepping for paradise. First of all, understand that paradise is a place. It's a place in an unseen realm. We don't know exactly where. I don't know if it's out there beyond the farthest galaxy somewhere or if it's, you know, might be hovering right over us right now. We don't know. But it is a specific place. It's a place where God is. It's a place where throughout Scripture we have, we have seen that God, uh, even though He is unlimited, uh, has always chosen to in some ways reveal Himself to people as being in a place that is central to His existence. And that's where paradise is. And that when a believer in Jesus, one who has placed their faith and trust in Jesus, who has, who has surrendered to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, the moment that person passes away, their soul leaves their body behind, and their soul is immediately taken into the presence of God in this place called paradise. Now, when they're there, it's going to hurt some feelings, okay? They don't come back to visit us. All right? Uh, that, that's romantic and nice and sweet, but they're there. Telling the story, Jesus said there's, they, they don't leave here. They're here. They wouldn't want to leave there. I mean, they're in the presence of Jesus. Why would they want to come back here? Come back here. So, by the same night, token, those who didn't believe in Jesus, who failed to put their faith and trust in Him are in a place of torment. And they will always be in a place of torment. You know, sometimes I, I hear people say, well, they're in a better place. Some people, folks, when they die, they aren't in a better place. I hate to break the news, but if they left this life without their faith and trust in Jesus, they aren't in a better place. They're in a place of torment. I'm get to why that's important for us to understand in just a moment. So I want us to understand that. It's a, it is a place. It's a place where our destiny, eternal destiny, is set. And then I also want us to understand that it is a place of blessing. It is a place of comfort. It is a place where we have been ushered into the presence of God by angels and where we are at rest from whatever we struggle with at earth, here on earth. Now, what do we need to do to get ready for paradise? Close with these three things. First of all, make certain about your relationship with Jesus. You see, there is no second chance. Once you leave this life, that's it. Your destiny is set. This may be an intermediate state, but it is an intermediate state in which you are locked into one of two destinations already. You are either locked in to the eternal presence of God track or you are locked in to the eternal torment and punishment track. You don't get to change tracks when you leave this world. Being a church member does not save you. Joining a church as a little child walking up and saying, I want to be a member of the church and then baptizing you doesn't make you a believer. It is you purposefully, willfully repenting of your sin, recognizing your sinfulness, and recognizing that Jesus had to die for you, and, and, and recognizing that that was for you, and receiving that gift of grace, and surrendering to Him as your Savior and Lord that seals your soul for eternity. That's why I preach that on Sunday morning in church because I know that there are people who sit in churches who are going to be surprised 
when they step out into eternity. Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, didn't we? And he gives this long list of things. I can see the Baptist list. Lord, didn't we serve on five committees every year? Lord, didn't we have some of the best casseroles that we took to dinner? Lord, didn't we tithe every Sunday without fail, even when I couldn't go get a haircut that week because I'd give him my tithe money? And Lord, didn't I, you know, didn't I all, and we have our long list of things we did. And what did Jesus say to them? Depart from me, even those good things, you're working iniquity because you never knew me. There was not a relationship. You had not surrendered. You didn't know who I really am, that I am Lord, that I died for you. So make certain your relationship with Jesus so that when that time comes, not if that time comes, I guess Jesus could come back and take us all home before we die, but chances are, are certain if he doesn't, we're all going to die. And at some point, our soul is going to leave our body and be in his presence. Make certain your relationship with Jesus. The second thing is, in the meantime, abound in God's work. In 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is talking about the final resurrection, when the graves give up their bodies and are reunited with their souls, and we have these glorified bodies, we're going to exist forever. Next week's sermon. He ends it by saying, in the meantime, while you're here on earth, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So not only be certain of your relationship with Jesus, but be busy about his work. Make his work your priority. And then finally, live with eternity in view. Whether it be waiting the final resurrection while your soul is in paradise, or whether it be on that last day when Jesus victoriously comes and calls his church to meet him in the air, regardless of what that case may be, wherever it is that you go, know that an end is coming. It should lead us to three things. First of all, confidence. Confidence. Thinking about heaven, thinking about the future, thinking about eternity should not frighten us in any way. If we know that we are in Christ, we know from his word what he has prepared for us, we can face death, we can face eternity with faith and with confidence that it is going to be so much better than the best that we could ever experience here. And we can live in that confidence. But it should also produce in us a sense of urgency. Because there are people around us that are one breath away from stepping out into eternity. And immediately going to one of those two tracks. And if we don't know for certain that they know Jesus as our Savior, there's nothing more important for us talk to them about and encourage them about than that. The knowing that they're going to be with him. Live with eternity in view confidently that you know where you're going when you die. But also urgently knowing that there are people all around us that this is very real. I don't know what, why it is. I guess it's just human nature. But we find it a lot easier believing in the reality of heaven and that we're going there than we do in believing in the reality of hell and that people we know may be going there. We think, well, you know, I'm just glad I'm going to heaven. Maybe that'll, no. Just as real as paradise is Hades. Just as real as being in the presence of God for eternity is just, just as real as being in torment apart from him for all of eternity. May we live with priorities in order, with heaven in view, and with our loved ones in our heart and in our mind.